events are about the energy thought leadership uh, and giving companies and uh, organizations the opportunity to present who they are in an authentic way. So we do our events one week in June, uh, giving people a chance to come in from all over uh, so that they're, they can go to as many events as they can fit into their schedule and, um, and meet all the other key people that they need to to make progress back in their own companies and organizations. So today I am here to talk to you guys about uh, failure points, sensitivity and impacts on energy technologies. I've had the opportunity to work on the small scale uh, and all the way through to the macro level, the utility scale. So I'm going to touch on a few different areas here. Uh, talk about materials for, uh, for solar devices. This is mostly taken from my PhD work at Penn State. And then I'm going to go over uh, solar thermal, design of solar thermal systems, uh, what, what the main failure points are there and, and how to avoid them. And then talking about power utilities. Um, if I have time, there, uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about a bonus topic. But uh, when I time this out, we didn't really have time for it. So I apologize. So just to start out, um, how do you choose your materials for solar? What are, what are the motivations that you might have? So I had been doing some work after Cornell at a company called EPIR Technologies out in, outside Chicago. They had um, foundational knowledge in cadmium, mercury, telluride, infrared devices. And they wanted to show that they were a force to be reckoned with um, with cadmium telluride solar cells. So I worked on that for about a year. But something that always kind of bothered me about the material is cadmium is toxic, it's carcinogenic, and tellurium is rare compared to some of the other materials out there. So while it has great potential, uh, great efficiencies as a, as a material for solar, it also has its own problems. And so I was looking for materials that didn't have those issues. So tin sulfide was a material that uh, was my advisor had worked on when he was a postdoctoral student. Um, and he, he offered me to, to research it further, and so I, I looked into it. It's at the baseline level, it had a lot of potential. It's black, it absorbs a lot of light and a very small amount of material. Um, it had the right band gap, the, the right um, properties to absorb the light at the visible level and convert it into electricity. All theoretical. Um, there's a lot of people who are doing research in this material. And so I joined their numbers to look at it. And tin and sulfur are earth abundant. So that's also good to know. Um, this isn't switching to the next slide. It's adding, every time you click on it, it adds another element on your slides so keep clicking. There you go. Okay. All right. So in my research, I did an extensive literature search on tin sulfide. And I found a vast uh, variety of how this material presented itself. Just by looking at it, uh, just by looking at these electron microscopic, microscopic images, um, I could see that there was variation. And I think that you guys might share that with me just by looking at it. This is at the um, uh, pretty small scale, I was talking 200 nanometers, a micron. All of these are made in, from different methods, and you're getting a different material by looking at it um, at, these, at this scale. And this translates to the electronic properties. Um, when you're talking about electrons moving through a material, you want to have a uniform material. You want it uh, to not have the opportunity for defects where the, any electrons that are excited will then just decay back into their ground state. That's something you want to avoid. And it's very hard to study a material that has such variety uh, in, in how it's grown. And I, I saw this in the literature search, and I saw this in my own experience in the lab. And when you look at the, um, so I was looking at sputtering this material. So sputtering is a, a method of deposition. Um, you excite a plasma. Um, the, you bombard the, a surface target with um, uh, high energy particles. It dislodges the material off the target and then deposits on a substrate. And at this high energy, there were a lot of um, properties that I, or a lot of uh, variables that I could play with. 
How much power am I applying to the target? How far is the target from my substrate? Um, what temperature is the, sub is the substrate at? All these different variables could be adjusted to tweak the material. And depending on what variables I adjusted, I got, again, a variety of microscopic uh, microstructures uh, of tin sulfide. And this came from the fact, uh, partly came from the fact that tin sulfide has multiple uh, phase formations that it can take on. The lowest energy phase is the one that everybody was studying, but there are these other phases that could be introduced, especially with a high energy deposition method like sputtering. And so when I looked at my materials that I was growing and the materials um, in the literature that people were presenting their results for, the electronic properties varied significantly. So we had, um, There we go. Um, so some of the properties that we were looking at, Hall mobility, how fast are the electrons moving through the material in an electric field, uh, the carrier concentration, how many carriers are in the material um, natively uh, based on uh, the, the structure and the defects, the native defects, um, what is the resistivity. All of these variables, the numbers were varying across everybody's research. And nobody was talking about it. They just said, well, we got good numbers, therefore this is a good material. But if you're not talking about how this is, is it repeatable? Can you make this material again at the same level? That was um, a fundamental issue that uh, needed to be addressed. Um, I think, oh no, my, my figure is missing. So. Seems that some things pop up when you click again. No, I'm, I'm seeing that it's missing here. Um, so for cadmium telluride solar cells, back in the day, in the late 90s, uh, high efficiencies of 13 to 15 percent were achieved. This was pretty great, but they hit a wall. They weren't able to exceed that 15 percent efficiency for a long time. And some researchers at the National Renewable Energy Lab and a few collaborating universities work to figure out, well, how do I, how do we take it to the next level? And they engineered the device to get to 16% efficiency. And in the last decade, it has been pushed to 22% efficiency. But they started with a strong material understanding of the cadmium telluride, and they were able to engineer the device structure to get to that next level. And some researchers at MIT wanted to replicate this with tin sulfide. But they started with material that was fundamentally not well understood. So going from one, two, three percent efficiency to four and a half percent efficiency through engineering the device isn't going to get you very far. Um, they started with a material that was maybe at two or three percent efficiency and taking it to four percent through engineering the device is not competitive with the other technologies that are out there. And so um, you're not Going back to my thesis of all of this, the sensitivity that you have um, at the materials level, you're, you want to think bigger. You wanna, you wanna, if you want to think big and get to those efficiencies that are competitive, the 20% level that silicon is at, um, your base material has to be well understood. And, um, and you have to realize that any processing that takes place after the deposition of your core material, your tin sulfide, it's it's all the way down here. You have all these other layers that are coming on after it. And every subsequent step in the process is going to impact that, that first layer that you're putting down, that fundamental, um, that foundational layer is extremely important to understand what it's doing and how subsequent processes are impacting it. So I left Penn State with, um, with the knowledge that tin sulfide was not the path to go forward with um, as, a, as an absorber material. Not to say that it won't, um, but there was a lot left to be learned, and um, I, I was you know, ready to move on to my next venture. So moving from the, uh, just to summarize here, um, the material properties are inherently linked uh, to the electronic <laughs> properties. You gotta understand what your fundamentals are before you can, um, when, before you can move on to the complexities of the broader device structure. Uh, so taking this to the next technology, solar thermal. 
Uh, I don't know if you guys have had any presentations yet on solar thermal, so I'm going to walk walk you through a few place a few parts of the the system. Um, solar thermal has a lot of connection points. Uh, the panel itself, uh, every everything inside the panel is going to be one piece of copper or one melded piece of copper. There's obviously connection points at each each year. The way that it works is you have uh, the working fluid, usually ethylene glycol, comes through the bottom copper pipe, uh, it rises through, and it comes out hot at the top. So there are layers on top of here that are absorbing the energy of the sun, converting it, uh, transferring it into the working fluid. And so you might be coming in at you know anywhere from 50 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on your, it's a closed loop system, and then coming out um, you know 100 degrees hotter. And this is dependent on the, the rate, the flow rate of the water or the fluid coming through the pipe. So uh, the copper here is experiencing a pretty high temperature gradient depending on the time of day, depending on if the fluid inside is flowing. Uh, it's not going to be moving through the system at all times unless you have a constant need for hot water uh, throughout the day. It's going to um, at a certain point, the fluid is going to reach its maximum temperature. It's not going to need to heat the system anymore, and it's going to stop flowing. But the sun will continue to shine. And what is in the panel will continue to increase in temperature. Um, and at that point, it might vaporize. You're getting to over 300 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature. And at that point, the copper is expanding. Right? We all, I think you guys have all taken those courses. So the copper is expanding. It needs somewhere to go. Um, and so right here at this point, it is flexible in this position. It's not welded in there. It, it can expand and contract with the temperature variation that's happening in the panel. Um, so when you have a few panels strung together, all of the copper in here is going to expand and contract throughout the day as the system is getting used. And you want to make sure that this panel is secured to its mounting structure and that the only thing that is moving is the copper pipe. That the panel itself is secure and it's not going to warp the, the panel out of place. The more panels you have, the more sensitive this is going to be and the more important it's going to be for your, your uh, panel to be secure. Well, the copper is moving. You need something to compensate for the expansion. And so this we call this a compensator. It's like a little accordion. It will contract when the copper is expanding, and it will um, expand when the copper is contracting. And so having this is extremely uh, is, is common between all the panels. You have two, one at the top, one at the bottom. But again, you need the panel to be secure to the mounting hardware in order for this to operate just as a little accordion that's contracting and expanding. That's all that it uh, needs to do. And like I said, it's especially important when you're operating at high temperatures, like above 300 <laughs> degrees. Um, so if you look at the entire uh, solar thermal system, you have um, each connection point is a potential failure point. You don't want it to be. You want it to be secure. But it's just something to keep in mind. Something. I learned about solar thermal systems as an undergrad and as a graduate student. And until I was in the field, it was not as real as it was. Um, in the classroom, you just don't, you don't see it until you feel it. And each of these connection points is a potential failure point if your system isn't designed properly. And so start out with your hot water system. It could be, um, this is a standard domestic tank. In a thermal, solar thermal system, uh, cold water is coming into the tank um, and it's coming out hot. Normally, you just have a heating element. Maybe it's gas fired, maybe it's oil. Um, or in this case, it's also supported by solar thermal. And so this is a closed loop system where you have the ethylene glycol coming in cold. Um, it goes through the pump station. So having the hardware all together is really convenient um, for manufacturing. It just it's all, it comes pre-assembled, so when you go into the field to install it, um, it simplifies the process. So the pump is pulling the fluid through the panel, pushing the fluid through the panel, 
Um, it comes out hot, goes back through the pump station. Um, this is convenient for sensors and uh, electrical wiring. You want it all to be centrally located. Uh, comes into the fluid, into the tank hot, comes back out cold, and it's closed loop system. Um, so when you get to the field, uh, if you're installing a system fresh, you're going to have um, the pump station to install, the panels to install. This is an expansion tank. So like I mentioned before, at high temperatures, the water or the fluid in the panel is going to be at uh, pretty, it's going to vaporize. And so thermal expansion, the copper is expanding, the, the working fluid is expanding. So the expansion tank is taking in that extra volume uh, that, that is coming from uh, the uh, gasifying of the fluid. So in here, there's a bladder or membrane um, that is set to a particular pressure that allows the fluid to push into the tank and compensate for the fact that there is now increased volume in the system. Um, so there's connection points here, connection points here. Um, and then if you're integrating, so in this example, it's an electric tank that has uh, solar installed directly into it. So it's all one unit. But you can also have a separate tank that is just storing the energy from the solar thermal system. And so then you might have more connections that are coming into the tank, uh, into that separate storage tank, and then into this tank. Um, and again, every connection point is a potential point of failure. And so you want your system to be as simple as possible when you go to install. Your installers are going to be working in all kinds of weather, cold weather, hot weather, rainy weather, snowy weather, you don't want them to take a day off because the weather is bad. And you want them to be able to do their jobs well, regardless of the conditions of their work, with the tools that they have. And so one of the things that the company I worked for implemented was, um, this is one part of the pump station, but if you have a separate, all the piping that is going to be integrated into this tank, there's a lot more uh, moving parts. And the most uh, effective way that we found to make our installers effective was to do as much assembly in a manufacturing controlled facility as possible where weather was not impacting them. Um, and so they would arrive on site with their pump station and have just a few places to make connections, um, mount the panels, and be out of there. And that was, um, that was something that was most effective for them. And going back to the, the compensator issue, having a connector, you can't see it on this slide or on this image, but at the top, the, the mounting bracket is right in between here and having it already measured to the right distance um, made for a very easy install. The, the installers didn't have to measure to make sure every panel was in the right uh, spacing from the next one because the mounting bracket that fit between the panels did that measurement for them. So those were the kinds of things that Made, it, made the job much easier for our installers. Um, so uh, what does this tell us? The engineering specifications of our system uh, are, we have to really consider the practical applications of what we're doing. So in, in the classroom and in, in your homework, you're probably doing a lot of calculations uh, to, to measure, uh, to, to predict what it is that is going to happen in the field. But practicalities in the field uh, are going to teach you a lot more. And I highly encourage you, if you have the opportunity to join a project team, to work in a research lab, through your internships, have, uh, give yourself the chance to get into the field, work with the tools, um, see and feel and smell the experience, because uh, it's going to take you a lot further once you, once you graduate and you're in the real world working. Um, and Installers are humans, and humans are subject to human error. So anywhere that you can eliminate the opportunity for human error is an opportunity um, for a perfect system. And if, um, if you don't have, you know, if human error is likely to come into play, then you want your system to be designed in such a way that there is enough uh, sensitivity in the system that it can handle that human error so that you're not going back and fixing your problems afterwards. Um, so the last topic I'm going to talk about is utilities. 
uh, with utilities, the environment is changing significantly for them. Uh, traditional utilities generated energy, delivered energy, sent their customers a bill for how much energy they used. Um, for them, if you use more energy, they're making more money. That's, that was uh, the business model. Uh, New York City is experiencing a unique problem. There is a high demand. There's a lot of people in a very small area. And it's gone to the point that the existing infrastructure is at capacity. So the amount of energy that uh, the utility can deliver to New York City is the amount of energy that is getting consumed. And new buildings, new facilities, new people coming in, there is not capacity for uh, these new buildings and new neighborhoods that are coming up in some of these locations because the utility has maxed out the amount of energy they can deliver. So they have a different kind of problem. They don't want you to use as much energy as they used to. They used to make money off of you um, consuming energy, and now they're not. That is, um, there's a few different problems that are coming into play. Uh, so let's say there's a new building showing up on Fifth Avenue. It's now you know, 10, 10 stories, 100 stories higher than the last building uh, that was there. They're going to have more consumption happening at that location. And the wires are not there to deliver the energy. So they could build another substation uh, to bring that energy to the new building. But this is typically very expensive. Uh, there, some studies were done before, uh, I think it was in Brooklyn, Queens, needed a new substation. And it was going to cost a quarter of a billion dollars to build the substation. Think about what you could do with that much money. Um, how many, how much renewables you could install, how many batteries, how many electric vehicles you could build. There's a lot of other ways that the utility wants to spend their money. They don't want to build another substation. It's not economically advantageous. So, um, so what else can they do? They can, um, they can build a microgrid. And that's what they've done in a lot of places in New York City. Um, with a microgrid, you are putting in an independently operating grid with renewables, with uh, battery storage, um, sometimes diesel fuel storage. Uh, you've got, you've now created an environment where this new building can operate independently. It doesn't have to. It's actually better for it to be in. Uh, linked into the grid, and with these microgrids they are, and so sometimes they're supplying energy to the grid, and sometimes they are um, just w working on their own. And the advantage here is you've now taken this money that's going into, instead of going into a substation, you've now created an independently operating area, and this has the advantage of, um, of lower, having a lower carbon impact, and with uh, cases like Superstorm Sandy, when the grid went down, a microgrid can continue to operate. And so now this building, uh, or this neighborhood even, has the ability to operate on its own in, the case, in these extreme cases. It makes the grid more resilient. Uh, when Superstorm Sandy hit, there, were, there was renewables in New York City. And they were generating energy. And that energy could not be used because the system was not built to handle that, uh, that, to handle the system going down. And so with the microgrid, uh, they are solving that problem. There are microgrids with the City University of New York, NYU, um, and there are several independent buildings. Um, the Hudson Yards is probably the newest and biggest uh, microgrid in the city. Um, so one of, the, one of the other problems that utilities are having is with, in, these uneven energy usage. Uh, so it could be that there's a morning peak or an evening peak. These aren't necessarily to scale. Um, but in this system, let's say they're, they're producing their baseline energy. And once you hit a certain level, the, the amount of energy that the, the standard output of the system is, has is not enough. And what we call these fossil fuel peakers have to come online. These fossil fuel peakers sometimes are only used for one month of the entire year. So you're building a plant that takes usually 20, 30 years to 
pay back the energy, uh, the investment on, to operate it one month a year. They're very inefficient. And um, <coughs> finding solutions that will not require this peaker plant to ever exist is something that utilities are extremely interested in. The peak demand usually is a result of heating and cooling. So in New York City, um, right now, uh, the, the cooling demand is the primary uh, is the primary reason for peaker plants to come online. A lot of buildings, a lot of heat generated um, from cooling the buildings, and therefore more energy is needed to cool the buildings. And temperatures are rising, uh, summers are getting hotter. Again, you just need more energy at these times. Uh, and and then, uh, so the so the seasonal load profile. I don't know if I have this image here. Yeah. So this is an example of a load profile for, uh, for a location where the winter months use the most energy. So if you have, a, if you have gas heat or oil heat, uh, it's not using electricity to heat your buildings, which is the case in New York City. They use steam to heat. Um, so your peak is in the summer, not in the winter. But New York City has all these plans to electrify uh, the city so that because electrical energy is easier to convert to low carbon or no carbon fuels. Um, and then, but that is going to create a new problem of we're actually going to be using, if, if you electrified all of the heat usage in New York City, you would end up with uh, higher demands in the winter than we currently need in the summer for electricity. Uh, and so again, heating and cooling are the biggest drivers for these peak demands um, and these, these uneven profiles. Uh, and so utilities are looking at a lot of different solutions. Um, one of the, these that has been implemented pretty widely in New York City um, and in other locations around the country and around the world is demand response. So if you can eliminate the need for the peaker plant, um, it is actually economically incentivized for these utilities to pay you not to use energy. So I get an email from Con Ed, Con Edison is my utility. I get an email from them a day or two in advance saying, we're expecting a heat wave. We're expecting a lot of people to be using your air conditioner. If you would be so kind as to let us take over your air conditioner, we will pay you money to do that. And so they get enough customers on board with this idea. They take over the air conditioner. It's not turning, they don't, they don't turn it off completely. They basically <coughs> can raise the temperature to Instead of you running it at 78 degrees, you're running it at 85 degrees. And so you're a little bit warmer in the apartment, but you're going to have money in your wallet as an alternative. And you get enough people online that you create these districts of people who are now feeding back into the system. And they're saying, yeah, you can take over my air conditioner. Um, that's one way to do it. There's also an industry uh, for, for larger buildings. There's obviously more incentive for utilities to, to talk to the bigger players and say, if you can run your, um, turn off your systems for a couple hours, um, you know, do your maintenance at, during that time. They, they work with these companies and these organizations to say, hey, come offline. We don't want to turn on our peaker plants. Here's some money to do it. It is economically um, advantageous to the utilities to take this path. Um, and as you have more and you know, as we have more and more buildings in New York City and other locations who are needing the energy, then it's um, and the, the wires can't handle more energy anyway. Again, it's to their advantage to incentivize uh, flattening out this curve so that it, they don't need a peaker plant during these times. Um, and. All of these things uh, are going to be more effective once you've implemented energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency improvements such as uh, double paned windows, uh, LED lighting, all of these things that can lower the regular energy usage, that's the first level. So again, Con Ed gave me some money. They said, we're going to give you a huge rebate to replace all your light bulbs. Um, I just got a bunch of light bulbs for $1 each. LEDs are typically around $10 each. It's a pretty good incentive, um, and it costs me less money to, to have LEDs in my apartment, and it costs the utility less money um, in the long run to have 
to supply you less energy. It seems counterintuitive, but hopefully my point is across by now. Uh, and once you've you know, evened out your energy uses as much as possible through energy efficiency incentives, through demand response, uh, then is a good time if you still haven't quite hit that point of eliminating the need for a peaker plant uh, to get some energy storage into play. And there's a lot of incentives uh, in the state for energy storage. Um, a lot of companies who are in this space, compressed air, uh, chemical energy storage, hydro, uh, hydroelectric storage, these are all ways that we can uh, address the needs of these peak times uh, where a lot of energy is consumed. And so um, going back to the original uh, message here, we've got what are, what are the sensitivities that the system has if they don't have enough mass of people, of companies who are willing to turn their systems off during those uh, high energy demand times, that's when a blackout happens or a brownout happens. And so for, you know, if there's too many people who are demanding energy and the energy cannot get supplied, the consequence is a blackout. And that consequence is something that the utilities need to avoid um, and, and they're incentivized to avoid. Uh, so having enough people coming online, incentivizing all these people, we're going to pay you money to turn off your our air conditioner. It's it's in their best interest to do that. A blackout is a, a widespread failure to supply electricity, and it seems to me if demand exceeds supply, a smart utility goes into brownouts and rotating blackouts and does, avoids the catastrophe you're describing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but even a brownout is something that they want to avoid. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want to end up in that position of having, um, they can control, control where the power is getting shut down, but that's something that they are avoiding through all of these programs. Supply hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. There are certain places that need the supply and they cannot have the energy come down. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about California's problem where they're deliberately turning off the power to avoid wildfires, but they're, they're still not even supplying the energy to those critical locations. So. Having a smart grid that can control that is part of um, part of that ecosystem that needs to be built. If they don't have the control to turn it off in certain locations, then but isn't the problem the transmission lines? I mean, they have the controls, but they they, they want to de-energize the transmission lines so they can't get the power to right. the city. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They could control it. Right. So having centralized um, or decentralized generation is is how you avoid that because if you, if you're only Going back to that original slide, you're only generating in one location. You're dependent on this on this power getting to your entire system. Um, whereas if you have uh, a decent some some energy generation um, on site, then you then you have a network that can supply energy to other locations in your system. Yeah, thank you. Um, so. So there, so there was a few problems that we talked about. Uh, the increased demand, uh, changing how utilities are running their business uh, with microgrids and demand response, they're solving some of these issues. Yeah? Yes, uh, thank you. For demand and response solutions, yeah. you need a smart grid or not? Yes. Necessary? Yeah, you need to have, um, so different levels. So I have, like the way that it works with the air conditioner units, uh, Con Ed supply to us uh, a smart meter that sits between the outlet and the air conditioner. And that connects to the internet, and I can control it from my phone. Con Ed can control it remotely from where they are. Um, that's, that's not a smart grid. It's a smart uh, technology. So there's different levels of, um, of implementing demand response through those. A localized level versus like broader smart grid technologies would be for, for something more like what you were talking about. Do you have any idea how many air conditioners are running in apartments that are empty during the day? People leave it on. Um, that is a huge issue. Yeah. So a lot of air conditioning units these days do have a timer feature. You can say, you know, turn on in five hours, eight hours when I get home. Um, with these smart meters, you can control it from your phone. You can say, I'm going to be home in an hour. I'm leaving the office now. Turn on. It'll be cool when I get there. Um, I personally don't know how many people are running their air conditioners. Uh, during those hours, but they don't really need it. Um, the peak time for usage is at the end of the day, though. So all summer, 
a couple summers ago it was usually like in the evening like three to seven or something this year it was seven to eleven was the most common time that they were telling us to turn our air conditioners off um, so that tells me that people are being smarter about it it's expensive people do not want to spend money to, I mean most people I'm sure there are people who have a dispensable income and can afford it but to have your air conditioning running all day that will drive up your your energy bill pretty high so um, there is already incentive not to do that um, but I can't say for sure that there aren't a lot of people the doing idea that. Is if you're smart which is what you're talking about you can try to do things like that yeah the water heater is another tar target what about water heaters? Heat your water in the water heater. Yeah. In the high price periods. Right. Yeah. So there is a lot of work being done. A lot of companies who are invested in how do we address this issue of, of peak energy usage. Um, there's uh, one of the largest office buildings in Manhattan has their entire sub basement is filled with ice tanks <laughs> to cool the building during those peak hours, and then they run run their systems to cool the tanks in the in the evening when the energy is cheap. Um, so for a large energy consumer like them, that, that is one pathway to take. And you can do ice storage, you can do electrical energy storage through batteries. Um, it just depends on how much money you're willing to spend. And, um, but there are incentives to do that because large buildings are paying a lot of money to run air conditioning and in the peak hours of the day when it's most expensive. So there are a lot of incentives there and the payback time so is pretty reasonable. Uh, for those systems. Yeah, um, I could talk a lot about all these different technologies, so I hope some of you are coming to the, the lunch after and I can talk to you more about it. Um, yeah, so a couple of the other issues that locations are having is that you have um, the electrification of heat um, and meeting these low carbon or zero carbon goals. Uh, it's, it's expensive and, and the systems are not there yet. So there's a lot of incentive to look for energy efficiency opportunities and to, to work with their consumers uh, on their energy usage. So just a final, few final thoughts. Um, upstream improvements to eff efficiency, uh, they really have the greatest opportunity for improvement. So where Con Ed is saying, we don't have enough, ener we don't have enough wires to supply you energy. If you take your energy usage down, um, uh, on a large scale, then then they don't have to build a new substation. They may not have to build a microgrid. These are opportunities that they're looking for. Um, and utilities are seeing the changes um, in the way energy is produced and delivered uh, and consumed. Uh, they they want their consumers to pay their customers to pay attention to how they're consuming energy. And so you might see on your energy bill you use less energy this month than you did a year ago, or you're using less energy than your neighbor. They want to make it competitive and they want to excite you about how you're consuming energy. Because in the past, you got your bill, you paid it, you were done. And uh, the utilities are interested in something a little bit more connected than they had been. Um, and just a final thought that didn't really touch on anything we talked about today, but 42% of carbon emissions come from manufacturing uh, of goods packaging, transport, and disposal. And you talk about transportation, you talk about commercial use, you talk about industrial use. When you really look at the numbers, manufacturing, uh, it all comes back to manufacturing. So every time you decide, you know what, I'm in a hurry, I'm just gonna grab a water bottle off the, the bodega. My phone is a year old, I'm excited about the new technology, let's upgrade. Every time you make those decisions, it's contributing to that 42% number. And it's not talked about enough. Um, and we are I'm in a few groups that are working to talk to our legislators about this number because it's really important for, um, for what we're talking about on a broader scale. How much energy are we really using comes back to that number. So um, thank you so much for having me today and I'd like to give you guys the opportunity to ask a few more questions. We do have time for questions, so let us have a few. Mm, there's a student right there. Yes. Uh, so my question is about the tin, the tin sulfide thing. Yeah. I wasn't um, clear. What was the final result from that? You made a, you made a bunch, you had a bunch of films made with a bunch of different processing parameters. Yeah. And 
what was what was the final conclusion from that? Is it going to be useful or not? Or so the processes that um, I was using for sputtering, it had potential. Uh, one of the things that sputtering offered that was unique um, is I, I started working with a target that was tin disulfide. So the end material that we wanted was tin monosulfide, so SNS. Um, but sulfur is extremely volatile and compared to tin. And one of, the one of the issues that people were coming across is that they couldn't keep the sulfur in the film. They were ending up with a sulfur poor material and that created a lot of defects that um, were making it not a viable material for solar. And so that, that way of making sure that your source material had more sulfur than, than your end material needed ensured that the volatility problem was avoided. Um, but we, we did struggle to, to get a viable device out of it while I was there and the project, you know, my time on the project ended. Um, so I didn't, I didn't produce a fully viable cell, but what I saw in, in my work and in other people's work is that it's not a great material for this and there are other materials that, like with perovskite solar, perovskite materials came out around the time I was finishing. There was a lot more excitement there and a lot more promise there and so. So, so it was more of a, a, a problem of processing and creating the material that you're trying to get to. Yeah. Very challenging. Yeah, it was very challenging. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Other questions? Uh, I, I, I misunderstood or, or didn't understand. You said at the end that 42% of the energy was used by manufacturing, and that seemed to be bad. It, it seemed to me that we want to make things, and it's going to take energy, and it's going to be some percentage of something. And yeah. so I wasn't upset about that. And certainly, energy is expensive, mm -hmm. so there's a good e economic incentive for not to use more energy than necessary to manufacture things. Right. Unless you think there's externalities that are being missed, and the price of energy is greater than what they think. But could you explain why I should be distressed that 42% of energy is used by manufacturing? Um, it's not 42% of energy, it's 42% of carbon emissions it has to do with manufacturing, packaging, transport, and disposal. And that conversation isn't being had. Manufacturing is important. It's our economic viability. We need goods, you know, we need food, we need um, clothing, we, we need to, you know, we're humans, we're going to consume. But thinking about the externalities of that is not really discussed. And what do we really need? Do we need to buy the latest iPhone? Do we need to um, redo our closet every three months? Those kinds of decisions are, companies are incentivized to sell. And they're not, we're not building into the system the externalities of transport, of, um, of packaging, and of disposal. And so our landfills are filling with unworn clothing, um, with electronics that are out of date and unable to be repaired to be used for a longer lifetime. Um, we're, not, we're not incentivizing companies to make long lasting products. It is in their best interest to keep selling, to keep making, but that is an unsustainable future. So, so how are you gonna tell me to live differently? I'm not gonna tell you to live differently. I'm just, I'm putting it out there um, that it's something that we don't talk about. And what are the solutions that we could talk about? Closing the loop, you know, instead of sending everything to the landfill, what are the other, it's a resource. We're sending our resources into the landfill and what else can we be using from it? Um, how do we close the loop? And as engineers, we should, you know, all of you are gonna be going into different industries that are gonna be manufacturing and, and how can you bring that back into your, into what you're thinking, into, into the boardroom decisions, into the manufacturing decisions. Um, I think it's important and I'm here to share that with you. You can disagree with me, we can have a nice uh, debate about it afterwards. So. Sounds like you want a carbon tax. I think it's one, one solution. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about, so in the middle, you talked about the um, solar thermal yeah. experience and the fact that you had done all this uh, coursework learning, mm -hmm. but there was this gap in terms of applications oriented. Yeah. And so if you had to do it over again, how would you fill that gap? So I worked, uh, I was on floor decathlon, um, but I missed the opportunity to be in the warehouse when they were actually building the, the house from in the in the warehouse. I was at 
uh, at the World's Fair when we, or not the World's Fair, the New York State Fair, uh, when we, we built the house, rebuilt the house up there to, to showcase. Um, having more opportunities like that. And I also um, would challenge professors uh, in their coursework, what are the opportunities where we can bring, bring the students to the field to show, uh, to show students what does it really mean to design the system and then execute on it. We have unit operations, um, uh, that, that is definitely a good opportunity, but you're not, you're not building there. And, and for me, that was the, the gap in my knowledge. Um, I learned it quickly, you know, you pick up on it, you figure it out, but I think having the opportunity to do it at Cornell would have been uh, extremely valuable. Yeah, it was the same, but what was the efficiency of the solar thermal system and would it be like, could you talk about like, the cost and would it be applicable to areas like in developing countries? outside of US? Yeah, so, yeah, so um, the first question was, what is the agency? Efficiency. Oh, what is efficiency? Um, <coughs> I believe the efficiency is about, I think it's 92%. Um, it's, uh, for the particular panels that we are working on, there's a lot or that we are working with. They are um, to convert solar heat into, to, to bring it into the working fluid is, um, much higher efficiency than uh, solar electric. Um, the material is absorbing a lot of heat. You just want to make sure that you're not radiating the heat out of the system. In the developing world, um, in, terms of the cost. in the in terms of the cost, so it does. Uh, there there is a significant payback time. Uh, it depends on what kind of system you're talking about. So we we did most of our installations on commercial sites. Um, but there's also uh, much less expensive systems where it's just a tank um, and a panel and you plug it into your hot water heater. Anywhere where there is a lot of sun, like in Africa, South America, um, India, that whole, you know, along the equator, it's pretty cheap. Um, Greece has been doing it for a long time. Israel has been doing it for a long time. And it's even, uh, there is so much sun that you don't need the most efficient systems to make it, uh, to operate it. And so it is much cheaper. Um, I don't know exactly the cost, uh, but it's, you don't, you don't need the best on the market to make it work. Um, so I'd, I'd imagine that there are opportunities there. I do remember that solar thermal was being installed on people's roofs for hot water before photovoltaic became. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so it's a much older technology, yeah. I think in many parts of the world, in India, Greece, I mean, it's, you went to the rural areas and that yeah. is just a yeah. fixture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Probably it's cost effective. Yeah. Easy enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And those are easier to install than the, the bigger commercial systems. <laughs> well, thank you again. Thank you so much. <laughs>